Take a look at this code. If I flip the order of these two lines, the code will still compile. All the tests will be green, but the application will be broken. Why? Because of a design smell called temporal coupling. Let me explain. In this code we have an application service, service A, which exposes several APIs to the rest of the application. For those APIs to work correctly, service A requires explicit initialization using the initialize method. There is also a second service, service B, which also needs to be initialized through its own initialization method. But here's the twist. During its initialization, service B needs information from service A. At first glance, this design looks fine. It's simple and easy to understand. But it only works if the services are initialized in the correct order. And that requirement, the fact that service A must be initialized before service B, is not clearly visible in the code. It's not reflected in the public APIs and even so the constructor of service B takes service A, that's easy to miss, especially when using a dependency injection container. At first, it might seem like the problem is just the ordering of the initialized calls. But that's only a symptom. The real issue is in the API design of service A, where the public APIs only work correctly after initialize has been called. And actually the same is true for service B. So the root cause is a design smell called temporal coupling that appears when class members must be called in a specific sequence. It introduces a hidden dependency in the temporal dimension. Such a design requires implicit knowledge to be used correctly, which makes the code fragile. So how can we fix this? Let's assume we don't have the time to redesign everything. There are still a few things we can do to make the hidden temporal coupling more visible. First we should document it. We can add a comment to the initialize method or the class itself. And we should definitely add a to-do comment where the initialization happens, something that makes clear that the order matters and that a better design is needed. Documenting this is the absolute minimum and once we are aware of the issue, there is no valid excuse not to do it. Second, we can make sure that the design fails fast. Right now the implementation of service A doesn't even fail if the initialize method is skipped or called too late because the respective member defaults to an empty collection. Using null would be better here. It clearly signals the not initialized state and results in a null reference exception if we forget to initialize this service. Even better, we can use contract.invariant at the beginning of each public API to make the expectation explicit that initialize must be called first and to fail fast with a meaningful message. These changes help us to detect problems early, but they don't fix the underlying design flaw. So what would? In principle, the simplest way to avoid temporal coupling is to follow a more functional approach. Return result values and pass them as parameters to the next operation. This way, flipping two lines won't even compile. It breaks the data flow and the compiler catches it. Of course that's not always possible, especially when working with classes that are intentionally stateful, like in our case. When state is necessary, we need to make sure that the class is never in an invalid state. The obvious fix is to move the initialization into the constructor. That way, the class is guaranteed to be fully initialized before it can be used. But sometimes that's not practical. Initialization might involve I.O. or heavy computations, which would delay the application startup if done inside the constructor. So let's look at a few alternatives. One option is to create an infrastructure that ensures all services are initialized before they are used. In one of my projects we did exactly that. All application services that required initialization implemented an iLifeCycle interface with an init method. At composition time, the infrastructure analyzed the dependencies between these services, built a dependency graph and invoked the init method in the correct order. Of course building such an infrastructure takes effort. But in larger applications, with many interdependent services, it can be worth it. Another option is to perform the initialization on demand. In simple cases we can use base class library constructs like system.lazy, which encapsulates the initialization logic cleanly. If that's not feasible, we can make the initialize method private, rename it to initialize on demand, make it return immediately if initialization is already done, and call it at the start of every public API. This approach works, but it can be error prone, especially if the public API surface of the class changes often. And then there is a more advanced solution, using a dynamic proxy like dispatch proxy in .NET. The idea is to keep the initialization in the constructor, but move it to a background thread. Then use a proxy to intercept method calls and block them until initialization is complete.
It's a bit of magic and I would only recommend it in special cases. We used it in another project where a large part of the system had already been built when we realized that our database access services were slowing down the application startup. Redesigning everything wasn't an option, so we applied this approach. It almost had no impact on the existing design, the only change was switching to a factory instead of calling the constructor directly. At the beginning of the video I said that flipping two lines didn't even break any tests. That's, of course, because our tests didn't cover this part of the code. It was considered as integration code, which is hard to test and our focus was on testing the application logic. And if you are now wondering which parts of your own code base aren't covered by your current tests, then check out this video where I show you a simple way to find that out in just a few minutes with almost no effort.